Hello and welcome to today's session. So we are continuing to discuss the play The Emperor Jones by Eugene O'Neill. Uh, in the last session, we stopped uh, with the end of uh, scene one and today we are beginning with scene two and we hope uh, to be able to cover a significant section of uh, the play. So scene two is a very short scene and this is one of those instances in this play where we realize how Eugene O'Neill uh, uses his uh, craft uh, craftsmanship to uh, showcase how even the descriptions of the terrain, even the stage directions, even these uh, you know, descriptions of a particular scene, that itself becomes a, a character by itself. So this is uh, this uh, um, scene two opens when it's almost nightfall. At the end of the scene one, we saw how uh, Emperor Jones, Brutus Jones, is leaving the palace, the the palace, the uh, the palace with. Uh, a lot of white symbols symbolizing power and we find that at the end of a conversation with Smithers he is preparing to leave and he leaves without any baggage it's just uh, you know his own self and uh, he's alone and we find him in the uh, at the end of a plane where the great forest begins so uh, there is a very detailed description of the terrain over here and we find that what happens psychologically to Brutus Jones his uh, the interior journey into his uh, psychological self that gets replicated here in the form of uh, the forest and the many things which are happening over there so uh, towards the end of that paragraph it uh, uh, O'Neill draws attention to the sound the monotone of the wind which serves to in uh, but to intensify the impression of the forest relentless immobility to form a background throwing into relief its brooding implacable silence so as mentioned in the uh, in one of the earlier uh, segments itself uh, this play it has a very sinister undertone so it uh, uh, repeatedly draws attention to the uh, dark ironies which are there beneath the surface so this play is uh, about this dark tone and there are also you know these various things uh, there are also these various things such as the memory of race the reality of race which uh, continue to uh, uh, you know, serve as one of the common threads connecting uh, the different scenes. So we find Jones entering and uh, he's walking rapidly and uh, we also see that he's very tired now. It is not, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, not the Jones, he's not the Emperor Jones whom we witnessed at the beginning of uh, uh, scene one who had just woken up from his afternoon nap and he was feeling very fresh and he was, uh, uh, you know, ready to take on uh, his responsibilities and he was uh, his usual arrogant confident self and we find that physically his uh, he's wearing out and there are a lot of these um, uh, fears and a lot of these uh, uh, difficult thoughts which are coming to him too and physically he's being really overpowered by this tiredness and we find that you know he continues to remain uh, very s strong and confident but uh, because uh, in one of those uh, descriptions it says then shaking himself like a wet dog to get rid of these depressing thoughts so he is beginning to get very real depressing human thoughts this is also as mentioned at the outset of the play this is also a journey into his uh, uh, humanity when the play opens in scene one we find that uh, he's almost an unreal self he is uh, in denial about what happened in his past, about what happened in his life. He is almost unwilling to accept the trajectory that his life is about to take. He is unwilling to accept that he could be killed. He is. Uh, he does not want to acknowledge even the sound of the drums, which uh, you know signals the impending revolution. Uh, but in uh, from the uh, scene two onwards, we find that this is a journey into his own self, and he is also in some form. Uh, descending into his own humanity and this is uh, promising and depressing at the same time because this descent is also um, uh, you know a path towards his own destruction because once he begins to once a human self begins to overtake and once he's conscious and once reality uh, begins to uh, overtake uh, the his, his almost surreal existence in uh, the island as the emperor we find that it is also you know he's just uh, uh, getting closer and closer to his uh, uh, destruction. He's hungry and uh, his fatigue is uh, really catching up to him. And uh, there's this very important scene uh, here, uh, right in the middle of this. He begins to search for a white stone. White stone, white stone, where is you? 
he was i know this was the right place and for some time uh, then then he immediately realizes that it is not the right stone yeah? and there is another stone guess that's it he scrambles to the next stone and turns uh, it over ah uh, ain't here either yeah so this white stone the search for the white stone and the inability to find the white stone also signifies this loss of power when the uh, scene one opened uh, when at the opening of the scene one uh, uh, when we were reading through the descriptions we realized that the whiteness was uh, very evidently uh, you know, showcased as a symbol of power and here this inability to find the white stone inability to locate the white stone begins to symbolize this eroding of power because the whiteness throughout this play we see that you know it, it it's, comes across as you know, symbols of power in, in various forms and towards the end of this it's, it's, it's almost like a soliloquy and we also find that here uh, there is a combination of uh, uh, realist and expressionist techniques being used over here particularly in scene two and uh, this also time when he there are certain terms which we do not find uh, getting attributed to uh, Brutus Jones. Uh, those sort of terms are used here from scene two onwards. This, uh, he has a frightened gasp and he also asks himself, Nigga, is he gone crazy? Is your lighting matches to show them what you are? For Lord's sake, you go ahead. Yeah. So uh, he also realizes that yeah, there is some sort of a descent into uh, ordinariness. There is some sort of descent into, if you may, uh, almost a state of madness itself and interestingly this is also the time when we find he's encountering those little formless fears who are also like um, uh, characters over here so um, the beauty in uh, O'Neill's play especially due to the you know the overt use of expressionist techniques we find that the background the abstractions they also become characters over here so there are these formless fears which are you know creeping out from the deeper blackness of the forest so if we find that now the overt whiteness of scene one is being replaced by this blackness uh, it's a formless shapeless black uh, 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 you know images all around so this is in stark contrast to the well-formed the well-furnished uh, image in the beginning where there's a throne at the center uh, the, the the throne is uh, you know placed in contrast with the whiteness around so here in the forest in the while um, Brutus Jones is also uh, you know, entering his humanity and at the same you know descending into certain kind of ordinariness we find that uh, the 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 experience is that of a predominant blackness so here you know we may also pause a bit and ask some very pertinent questions which have been asked by a number of critical scholars before about the stereotypical depictions of race over here how uh, Eugene O'Neill also um, like many others uh, in the 20th century uh, is conveniently using blackness as a metaphor to blackness as a, a very predominant trope to capture some of the psychological turmoils these you know hallucinations and this irrational behavior of a black man so um moving on uh, we'll quickly read through the how the uh, the uh, little formless fears are being described uh little formless fears creep out from the deeper blackness of the forest they are black shapeless only their glittering little eyes can be seen if they have any describable form at all it is that of a grub worm about the size of a creeping child yeah? so see the, the language the tone is very dark over here very depressing they move noiselessly but with deliberate painful effort striving to raise themselves on and failing and sinking prone again jones turns about to face the forest he stares up at the tops of the trees seeking vainly to discover his whereabouts by their confirmation so he's unable to so unable to sense any source he's descending into some world of irrational and formless uh, fears and uh, we find that you know in these brackets the um, stage directions and uh, the expressions for the protagonist are given we will find this i uh, you know the rapid uh, uh, succession of emotions um and it's from um mournful foreboding to a sense of forced defiance so he knows that he needs to you know pick himself up and move on from there so um he uh, he is also in the background he's hearing this uh you know the quickening sound of the tom tom the, the the drumming is also getting closer which also signifies the impending revolution they are getting they're preparing for um battle they are preparing to bring this regime to an end 
So um, with renewed confidence, we find that Brutus Jones is uh, helping himself uh, to be up again. And he is also look at the kind of words which are being used over here. Yeah, about uh, then urging himself in with manful resolution. Get in, nigger. What are you scared at? Ain't nothing there but the trees. Get in. Yeah. So there is a. Uh, there is this brief moment when he's hallucinating, but a uh, half part of his brain also knows that he needs to move on, that this is just, uh, uh, you know, a set of uh, uh, emotions, a set of uh, images that he needs to push out of his brain, out of his memory. So scene two is also this transition scene where we are being uh, made aware of this fact that no matter how far he escapes, um, no matter how far he runs away from certain physical realities of his, uh, uh, um, you know, whatever happened to him in, in, in America, uh, we find that he cannot escape those fears and those images and those memories which he has already internalized. So the racial memory, the oppression and uh, the, the, the trauma that he is uh, uh, reliving, you know, which is, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, that he's reliving almost uh, in, in a very intense form over here, it comes not from any external trigger. It's it's all there inside, and uh, it we also uh, this there's again this uh, 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 you know, notion which is being foregrounded over here that these fears which have been internalized, which have been part of his collective memory, it's difficult for him to escape from that, regardless of uh, the efforts that he has been making, whether he is the uh, the prisoner who breaks out of prison in America or whether he's the emperor who you know, builds uh, a, a range of subjects under him in uh, in this island, uh, we find that in both places there is an inescapability from these internalized emotions and these internalized memories. So with this we enter scene three where he continues to have very intense uh, hallucinating experiences. So this is also, you know, a scene where we can corroborate some of the events, some of the uh, you know, the discussions, some of the exchanges that uh, Brutus Jones and Smithers had in scene one uh, because this here um, uh, Jones is no longer in <coughs> denial. Jones is a very vulnerable uh, human being over here. Jones is uh, being taken over. He's being uh, completely overtaken by and overwhelmed by the experiences and the trauma that he's facing from inside. So um, he uh, begins to see you know the, the figure of uh, uh, Jeff uh, another Negro man begins to emerge over here. So the audience clearly uh, does not have much of an idea of, of you know, who this uh, uh, Jeff is, but, you know, he, he emerges from this uh, uh, masked blackness, which continues to remain as, uh, you know, the background in this, uh, uh, in this scene as well. So we find the figure of uh, uh, Jeff emerging, and this is how he's being described. He is middle-aged, thin, brown in color, dressed in a Pullman Porter's uniform cap, etc. So perhaps this is someone who's known to um, uh, Jones from his, you know, the, the, uh, the Pullman Porter life in America, which he also briefly recalls, yeah, which he's made to recall during his exchanges with uh, Smithers. So the audience, you know, here the setting, the stage uh, directions and the descriptions are very interesting because the audience um, sees Jeff emerging. Uh, but Jones is yet to see him. So he continues to talk to himself and he is uh, uh, not in a great shape and he is uh, trying to deal with her, you know, the, 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 this massive blackness which is growing in the woods. And suddenly he realizes he walks into the clear space and stands transfixed. Yeah, this term is important as he sees Jeff in a terrified gasp. Yeah, so he's already frightened of these uh, shapeless, formless fears, which were growing inside him and they were like, uh, you know, taking external form. And this uh, was in scene two. And even in the scene three, we find that those formless fears are taking real shape, yeah? The shape of a human being. And uh, it is through Jeff that, you know, we now begin to look into uh, this uh, uh, troubled man's past as well. Who said is that you, Jeff? Yeah, he's really startled, starting toward the other, forgetful for a moment about his surroundings and really believing it's the living man that he sees in a tone of happy relief. Jeff, I'm sure mighty glad to see you. Don't tell me. Uh, they told me 
you don't die from that razor cut I give you. So here is this uh, uh, man, Brutus Jones, admitting to himself that he had actually killed Jeff. They told me that you had died from that razor cut that I gave you. And this is the same man in scene one who was in denial of the fact that he had killed another man. So now the, 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 the puzzle pieces are beginning to, uh, you know, things are beginning to fall into place. And... Um, and and the 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 kind of uh, descriptions, the instructions in the bracket within brackets continue to be interesting. Stopping suddenly, bewilderedly. So we find that the kind of uh, terms which are being used to describe uh, Jones's uh, state, uh, uh, you know, physical state, his mental state, it's very different from that first scene one. So uh, he's also very surprised, uh, and uh, because why? What is Jeff doing over here? And Jeff continues to play mechanically, play with dice. So there is a uh, uh, what comes across is very interesting from this point is that um, whomsoever um, um, uh, Brutus Jones is meeting, they are all in you know some mechanical motion. Yeah, um, uh, Jones seems to be the only human figure in all these hallucinations. The others, they are they come across as quite composed and they make mechanical movements and there's nothing uh, uh, from Jones or anything from the external that can that seem to uh, affect the figures which emerge it's only Brutus Jones uh, you know who's descending into uh, some sort of a madness who's descending into some kind of a depressing uh, 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 mode with uh, every one of these meetings as in when these you know these hallucinating meetings uh, progresses so um, there is suddenly uh, there is also this uh, sudden mo sudden change of emotion. First, he's happy to see that Jeff hasn't uh, Jeff had not died, but he's also disappointed. Yeah, because uh, in, in the sudden frenzy, we find uh, that uh, you know uh, he uh, he jerks out his revolver in a frenzy of terrified rage. Nigga, I kills you dead ones. Has it got to kill you again? You take it then. So this is a moment when we realize this, the kind of dichotomy which is at play uh, when we are examining uh, the, the internal psychology, the, 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 the emotions that uh, Jones is uh, going through. Uh, the, the play is um, are staged in such a, um, fascinating ways that we see both sides of his humanity. He's a very vulnerable character. We find that he is uh, unable to take this uh, descent into uh, uh, I don't know from his status as an uh, and as an emperor and we almost begin to feel sorry for him when we see him in this condition but we also realize that he does not regret uh, the actions that he had uh, the committed the crimes that he had committed uh, for a half a moment he is uh, happy to see that Jeff is alive that uh, but uh, in, in you know in less than a uh, and less than a moment, we find that he you know, pulls out his revolver and ensures that Jeff is dead too. This is, of course, a hallucination, but it tells us a lot about the kind of person Brutus Jones is. And another way to look at this is through the point of view of the 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 uh, you know the authorial figure. Um, so, as mentioned before, there have been a lot of critiques about how racial memory is constructed in this uh, uh, play. And here we find that here is a, a black man who is not allowed to come out of the kind of stereotypical uh, compartments into which, you know, he's forced to let yeah, his, uh, the, the, the kind of associations with the blackness and trauma and violence and, uh, uh, you know, this um, uh, intense desire for committing crimes. You know, he's, it's, it's almost uh, um, uh, left in a loop and unable to get out of it in any way. So uh, here we uh, find that um, we uh, this is uh, uh, this is a very telling scene uh, because um, in scene one we're not entirely sure whether uh, this man was framed or whether he had actually committed a murder. Yeah. So here is a man who has no affinity to his brother in the sense, you know, another black man, and he kills him kills Jeff without showing any sense of remorse and this is something which is getting enacted before the audience just so there is no ambiguity about the kind of crime that 
uh, the um, Brutus Jones had committed. And uh, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, you know blurred lines over here, but still we find that these uh, uh, it's a very uh, useful complication. It's a very uh, productive uh, problematization that we find over here. You know the 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 aspects of the past about memory, about history, everything is being brought together over here almost in a collage. Yeah. So uh, the way um, Brutus Jones is made to respond to Jeff's uh, uh, image over here. It is, uh, you know, deeply implicated in the way he was uh, leading his life as a porter. It's uh, also, you know, deeply implicated in the way uh, his he was uh, he was historically, socially treated as a black man in America. So this is, in some form, an inevitable result of uh, these, um, you know, these uh, twin forces about his personal experience, his personal animosity with the. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, his personal animosity with uh, Jeff and also the kind of rut into which he is, uh, you know, he's fallen into. There seems to be no escape from that. So with this, we quickly move on to scene four, where, uh, you know, he continues uh, to be in the forest itself. So here we find that he has very visibly deteriorated. His uniform is ragged and torn. He looks about him with Numbed surprise when he sees the road. He flops down exhaustedly and pants heavily for a while, then with sudden anger. So here, uh, you know, his, um, uh, we, we, his, uh, he's become quite a pathetic figure over here. Physically, he has almost entirely deteriorated. His looks have changed completely. And look at the way, you know, the grandeur with which he was introduced in scene one. And now he is entirely in tatters. And he is also running, running away from the same subjects over whom he was ruling like an emperor. On the one hand, he is uh, still looking at himself like an emperor. That's where he draws his energy from. But on the other hand, he realizes that he he realizes that you know it's all coming to an end as well, though he cannot entirely admit that. So here is this brief um, uh, period where you know he is trying to uh, uh, you know, talk to himself to build his confidence. You fool, nigger! He ain't no such things. Don't be Baptist person. Um, told the Baptist uh, pastor and tell you that many times, is you civilized or is you like these ignorant black niggas? Yeah. So it's a, it's a very interesting way in which his subject possession is being foregrounded over here. Uh, he is being uh, you know tormented by these uh, hallucinating images and these uh, uh, formless uh, fears. Yeah, everything is taking a shape now. So we find that, uh, uh, you know, he's talking to himself and he is drawing energy, he's drawing confidence from um, his interior self. And he's also now again, you know, that's the way he did in scene one. He's making this connection with, uh, you know, his affinity towards Christianity, the kind of bringing that he had, the way, you know, he was a, a, a member of good standing, as he himself says, within the Baptist church. So this is uh, very, very, um, uh, you know, interesting and problematic as the same at the same time. And the use of the term civilized over here uh, is placed in a, in a rather ironical way. And uh, Brutus Jones, uh, he identifies civilization with whiteness. It's very evident in the play. And this is also, you know, one of the uh, biases of this play, which has been exposed by a number of other uh, uh, critics as well. So uh, here he uh, he is identifying civilization with whiteness, and he identifies himself with blackness and uh, uh, ignorance, which is uh, you know again a stereotypical way to look at it. So uh, and he's telling himself that you know there was no Jeff and none of these figures were actually there, and he's all imagining it, and he is drawing validation from the Baptist uh, uh, priest or from the Baptist uh, parson. Uh, you know, he has these repeated, uh, you know, these repeated um, mentions of the Baptist Church also shows about the kind of uh, influence the church had on him. And despite that, we find that religion, Christianity, fails to redeem him, fails to save him from the circumstances uh, into in which, you know, he's got. And now he finds another set of, uh, you know, these apparitions, they continue to come again. Uh, we find that you know these uh, these images are all very primitive in nature, and uh, it's it's a very stereotypical representation. It's a replication of uh, the kind of images from which uh, this uh, 
um, Brutus Jones is ideally trying to get away from. So there's a you know, small gang of Negroes who now emerge and some carry picks, others shovels. They are followed by a white man dressed in the uniform of a prison guard. So now we, we are trying to make sense of what happened in the prison. If you remember the exchanges with Smithers in scene one, the uh, you know he does talk about uh, killing a white man yeah so now in this uh, you know in these uh, uh, in this experience which is being related over here we find that perhaps it's actually true to he killed a white man too which was perhaps this uh, prison guard yeah whose uh, apparition is now haunting him yeah who's uh, about whom he is now hallucinating yeah? so um and we also find that there is a sense of authority. Yeah? So very uh, briefly, we will um, you know, uh, see him praying to him. Yeah? The prison guard cracks his whip noiselessly. And, and this is uh, uh, Brutus Jones trying to uh, uh, you know, appeal to God to save him yeah? on and off. Yeah? We find this over here. And uh, yes, sir, yes, sir, I'm coming. So we find that there is a sense of authority that uh, Brutus Jones has internalized. He spent the last two years, as uh, per you know, uh, the the details that we uh, call out from scene one. He would spent the previous two years as an emperor, but that does not that has not essentially changed what he has internalized in terms of his racial memory, in terms of the racial hierarchy, and in terms of the sense of authority to which he has uh, you know he has been submitting here. Even though it's a it, it is a hallucination and uh, it it is you know it's a, in, in all likelihood it is his truest self which is uh, getting exposed over here too, and he's continuing to uh, refer to the prison guard as you know he's he's not using any swear words over here and we find that you know throughout scene uh, one and uh, even in scene two when he's encountering the formless uh, uh, fears yeah so there is no doubt of swear words uh, here he addresses the prison guard yeah with reference yeah as uh, yes sir yes sir I'm coming so um and and also in this process and we we find him that the guard turns his back on him and walks away contemptuously instantly Jones straightens up with arms upraised as if his shovel were a club in his hands he springs murderously at the unsuspecting guard so this is the second instance where a certain set of uh, events which were referred to in very unreliable terms in the first uh, scene uh, the audience uh, we are as a reader we are now able to witness those events first him trying to kill uh, jeff and uh, in fact you know, jeff gets killed twice you know once in real terms and the, you know when he uh, sees him again as uh, uh, as an apparition uh, jones uh, jones kills him again so here now we find him uh, you know springing murderously uh, at the unsuspecting prison guard yeah who presumably is a white man so here just when he's about to, in the act of crashing down his shovel on the white man's skull, Joan suddenly becomes aware that his hands are empty. He cries despairingly. So this absence of sho shovel, yeah, that's again very key in this uh, uh, brief uh, scene. He always needs an external tool in order to assert himself. In the absence of those external tools, in the absence of those external weapons, he cannot assert himself at all. Here, the only thing which enables him to have power, because racially, he's always already inferior. And uh, even in terms of, the, you know, the administrative official capacities, the prison guard is way above. He exercises authority over uh, Jones. And it is the shovel which gives him this weapon. You know, it is this, uh, uh, you know, the tool of violence which helps him to dominate over this prison guard. So this awareness that his hands are empty, yeah, that, that leads him to utter despair. Where's my shovel? Give me uh, my shovel I, till I split his damn head. So this is, again, we find a pattern over here. There is absolutely no sense of remorse in this man's heart. He has, you know, he has half a chance to redeem himself when he is encountering uh, Jeff alive. But, you know, he chooses to kill him. He again encounters the prison guard alive. Yeah, And he is, uh, you know, look at the way in which the guard, guard is described. He is the unsuspecting guard yeah he's uh, you know trying to attack an unsuspecting guard and uh, he realizes that his hands are empty and he is appealing to his fellow convicts to hand over a shovel to him just so he could split his damn head yeah so there is a brief moment in all of these scenes where his humanity his uh, 
uh, you know, the, the, the whatever capacity he has for some uh, compassion, it it comes uh, that that humanness it uh, gets foregrounded very briefly, but he very soon descends into this dark place, yeah, this blackness, yeah, which is also the background of the play from scene two onwards. So, um, he of course, you know, he pulls out his um, uh, revolver and uh, he frantically fires at uh, the prison guard too. Uh, the apparition of the prison guard and killing him again. Uh, I kill you, you white devil. It's the last thing I ever does. Yeah. So even if it means that this is the last thing that he gets to do as a human being, he is out there. You know, he's determined to kill the prison guard. So another important thing to notice over here is that if you recall, in scene one, he had this revolver and he had shown you know the set of bullets, including the one last, uh, uh, the the silver bullet. Yeah. So he is now using up his uh, uh, bullets. Yeah, he's been firing. Yeah, and now we will see that you know even in the upcoming scenes he will continue to use his uh, bullet. He's, he's basically you know he's just firing in the uh, dark, but uh, in his mind he is also attacking. He's uh, re-killing, if we may put it that way, the people whom he had already murdered before. Yeah. So um, uh, with the uh, scene five, yeah. This is, uh, he's completely in tatters. His pants are in tatters, his shoes cut and misshapen, flapping about his feet. And uh, very soon he also realizes that his shoes are not being helpful. On the contrary, you know, they're hurting him more. So he realizes he's better off without them. Yeah? And he himself, you know, he looks at himself and sees what a pathetic figure he is. Um, look at you now, Emperor, you're getting mighty low. Yeah? So he's stripped off his, uh, you know, very systematically, yeah, but quite, uh, uh, you know, gradually, but very systematically, he's been uh, stripped of all these external you know, ornamental things which were holding him together. So this is quite a fall from what he was in the, in, in scene one. Yeah, there's no grant here. There's no, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing pompous about the way he dresses or the way he carries himself. Yeah, he is... Uh, uh, losing things one after the other, his weapons, his uh, uh, the 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 exterior things which decorated his uh, uh, you know his uh, looks, which decorated his office, he is losing things one after the other. So what happens in between, you know, particularly in this scene, is that there is again the, a brief moment where he gets into this mode of confession. Yeah, Lord, I done wrong. Uh, yeah, there's also this brief moment of confession. Yeah, so we'll quickly read through this. Suddenly he throws himself on his knees. Yeah, he gets into this position of confession, of prayer. Yeah, raises his clasped hands to the sky in a voice of agonized pleading. So pleading. So here is where the influence of Christianity, which seems to have been quite strong in his mind, you know, this is also something that he has internalized. So during this phase from scene two onwards. Whatever is getting articulated is, you know, what he has internalized, the, his experience of race, his experience of authority, and now his experience of Christianity. Lord Jesus, hear my prayer. I'm a poor sinner, poor sinner. Yeah? And he also you know, confesses that when I catch his Jeff cheating with loaded dice, my anger overcomes me. Yeah? So this is partially a confession and partially an act of justification. He is trying to justify the source of his anger. Our Lord, I done wrong. When the guard hits me with a whip, my anger overcomes me. So here, you know, he is uh, uh, exposing his vulnerabilities, how his anger gets the better of him. And this anger is not directed at particular people. This is also directed at the circumstances. This is also directed at these, you know, these uh, historical forces which have placed him where he is. So, um, He's, he's, he's actually, you know, very directly, he's begging forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive this poor sinner. And stop that drumming sound in my ears. Yeah. So here's a combination of these uh, hallucinations and reality. But the drumming sound is real. We know it from scene one. And uh, this is uh, there in the background along with the blackness, the growing blackness. And he's, uh, you know, he's, that, that sound is um, painfully haunting for him. And he wants, to, uh, he wants to be forgiven for the murders that he committed before. And he also wants you know, some respite from this doom uh, which is impending. And he now is almost certain that 
he's getting closer and closer towards his destruction and he is uh, trying to beg forgiveness just so he will be rescued from that you know and, and you now he's looking up to christianity as you know the, the the prayers that he had learned as one last hope you know by you know getting into a mode of confession you're know, getting into this mode of asking for forgiveness you know? so and that certainly that clearly does not help uh, much uh, because you know at the end of this we realize how he is losing yeah uh, even his shoes and he looks at himself and realizes how he is getting mighty low so um now uh, another set of you know another crowd emerges here a crowd of figures silently enter the clearing from all sides yeah so this is getting very dramatic over here so we uh, this is where you know the, the realist techniques and the expressionist techniques again come together in very very a curious and interesting ways and this is particularly important over here because he is uh, you know there is uh, uh, a very in-depth examination of both individual memory and collective memory over here the memory of this individual his individual experiences and the collective experiences into which he and you know others in his community have been forced into you know both become very important in defining these uh, 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 the, these moments, you know, and defining his actions too in a certain way. So we never get into the details yeah. of uh, this, uh, how uh, he had led his life as a Pullman porter, except that maybe, you know, there was always this growing sense of resentment. There was always this growing sense of anger that, you know, he really lost it when he catches one of his own, uh, you know, one of his own uh, people, uh, you know, cheating in a game. Yeah, so, and, and again, you know, there's this, uh, uh, the, um, in the prison guard's uh, instance too, it may not be the first time that the guard had hit him. Maybe it was this growing resentment and the growing anger that he couldn't contain anymore. So we do not get much insight into what had happened. But we, what we uh, clearly know about over here, which is what you know will become more uh, evident in the next uh, scene in this, uh, you know, in this description. What uh, becomes uh, really evident for us is the, the the historical background. Yeah. And uh, here, you know, it is uh, the, the, the details are, uh, are quite graphic over here and it uh, helps us recall the history of slavery, helps us recall the dark history uh, of uh, racism. So all are dressed in southern costumes of the period of the 50s of the last century. So it is that specific in terms of its historical location. Yeah, there's a crowd of figures and this is something which is emerging from his collective memory from the historical memory of the experience of race uh, for his uh, particularly for the african americans there are middle-aged men who are evidently well-to-do planters yeah so these are the ones you know who are on the other side there is one spruce authoritative individual the auctioneer there's a crowd of curious spectators so all of them have a certain role to play yeah so there are these uh, uh, you know the african slaves who are about to be auctioned the ones who are powerful enough to buy them and a set of spectators who are also equally important in this history because this is a certain kind of a spectacle which is aided by not just the ones who is on uh, you know who's powerful enough who's uh, wealthy enough to uh, the ones who are uh, powerful enough and wealthy enough to buy but also the ones who are enjoying this as a spectacle so this is an instance where we find uh, uh, a complete dehumanization of uh, uh, you know young men and women they're being sold and when uh, this gets played and replayed in Jones's mind it has a very different dimension altogether so we also realize that you know this this experience of uh, his recollection of uh, slave trade we, we don't get an idea about whether you know he was actually part of the uh, you know whether he was actually um, uh, yeah, you know, sold off or whether he was part of this auctioneering process at any point or whether this is something that he has internalized, which, uh, you know, he's been forced to internalize just by virtue of belonging to that community. But this is also an instance which presents itself as a foil to the other two instances. Yeah, because this is the historical rut into which a person like Brutus Jones is caught into. So there should be a different way in which one uh uh, should be enabled to you know there should be a different way to read the other two murders because it springs from this historical reality and so to coming back to this 
Um, there is a, a crowd of curious spectators, chiefly young ballets and dandies who have come to the slave market for diversion. So that's also an entertainment. Yeah? So this makes it, you know, this is an image which is very problematic, which is very complicated. It tells us about a very dark history where a lot of people, even though they were not directly participating in the trade per se, a lot of individuals were responsible for this, uh, uh, you know, for this historical uh, practice. And uh, the, the violence in that sense, the trauma is in, uh, uh, you know, not just in this act of slavery, not just in this act of, you know, selling and buying, but also in, in converting this into a, 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 you know, a scene of a, a spectacle. All exchange coldly greetings in dumb show and chat silently together, yeah, the hollowness of it. Yeah? There's something stiff, rigid, unreal, marionettish about their movements. So as I mentioned before, all the other these characters who appear as figures, apparitions, yeah, in this hallucination, uh, they are all uh, they, they have they all have very mechanized movements over here. They are not entirely human. They come across as very unreal, but from real instances, but from real historical uh, past. They group themselves about the stump. Finally, a batch of slaves are led in from the left by an attendant. Three men of different ages, two women. One with a baby in her arms nursing. They are placed to the left of the stump beside Jones. Yeah, so three men and two women. Yeah, one of whom is nursing. Yeah? So such graphic description. So this also tells us how invested uh, Brutus Jones is in this historical reality. This is a reality from which he cannot escape at all. And this is something which has been caused by a number of external forces, something which cannot be zeroed in on something which cannot be attributed to one prison guard or another cheating uh, friend yeah so there are there are you know multiple things economic social political to be taken into account so this plea in that sense uh though in in uh, uh in these very curious terms is i'd ask such very pertinent questions yeah to which un unfortunately you know there are no direct answers but the important thing is at the turn of the century in the early uh, uh 20th century uh uh, itself these questions began to be asked and by dramatizing this yeah he is also uh, Eugene O'Neill is also making this uh, you know the, the you know, translating this question he's also passing this question on to the audience the white planters look at them appraisingly as if they were cattle yeah so the 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 graphic nature of this is very depressing and exchange judgments on each the dandies point with their fingers and mate with your remarks they're just there for a diversion the bellies, the, the, sorry, the bellies titter bewitchingly, all this in silence, save for the ominous throb of the tom tom. So that is a reality. He's now back to reality. The drumming is uh, getting closer and closer. So with this, uh, we will uh, wrap up today's session and um, we will continue to discuss the play in the next uh, uh, class as well. Thank you for your time and I look forward to meeting you in the next session.